Welcome to the Flow State Podcast, where we're all about finding balance. We're your hosts, Monica Groney and Nora Candido. Now let's get into the flow. Welcome back, everyone. It is season two. We are so excited to be back and to have an amazing guest on today. I hope everyone had a great new year, a great holiday. Um, Today we have Jenna, Dr. Jenna. She is an environmental health scientist and dietitian by training, but she grew frustrated by the lack of data around harmful chemicals. Maybe you guys have heard of endocrine disruptors. I feel like they are talked about a lot in the hormone space. Um, And she decided to do something about that. So Jenna, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Monica and Nora, for having me. It's always nice to chat with beautiful ladies. Yeah, so fun. Um, Do you want to maybe just share a little bit about your background and this frustration that grew for you around these chemicals? Yes. So, I mean, Monica, as Monica mentioned, I was trained as a dietitian and environmental health scientist. So a lot of my research have been focusing on Um, How do we assess environmental exposures and uh, how does these exposures really impact our lives? And one thing to mention is, you know, our health is determined by both genetic and environment. But genetic actually only accounts for about 30 percent of your disease risk. The rest of them are from your environment. One phrase we always say is, you know, genetic, um, genetic loads the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. So your environment is actually really, really, really important. And what really grew me frustrated was, again, like the lack of data. So um, while I was doing this research, what we what we realized is that, you know, you can you and I can have the same exposure, but we could respond really differently because of our genetic. So unless we are able to measure what's internally, what's exactly happened to you, there's really hard for people to determine, okay, how does this environment really impact me? And we don't have that kind of data. We have a ton of genetic data, but if we don't have environmental data, we just don't know how does our environment interact with our genes and how does disease happen. So this was kind of my, professionally, that was my frustration. And I also had a lot of frustration personally, had a lot of fertility struggle myself. And after many four actually um, late stage miscarriages, I was only getting the answer from the doctors like, good luck next time. It's not very satisfying, you know, when you have, you, when you have done all the genetic testing, every test possible, no family history, and you just couldn't figure out what's going on. And that was really, really frustrating. And, you know, because I study the environmental exposures, I know environmental exposures have a, a ton of linkage to fertility struggles, with fertility problems. So I was looking into, you know, how to solve my own problem. And when I went to the doctors um, asking for tests such as environmental exposures, the only test available at the time was only heavy metal. And it just incredibly frustrating because I know like tests are available. I know we've been measuring this literally for decades. Wow. Not only the public don't understand like environmental exposure really impact their fertility and then we don't even have a test to measure it which is like really crazy you know this day and age where you can test your genes left and right which you can not do much about um yet environment you can actually take control much of it you can actually take control and yet we don't really have anything no solutions um anyway so that kind of prompted me to start a company thinking, okay, one is, can we provide a service to people, at least understand their exposures and do something about it? And second, can we collect data so then we can better inform how does our environment impact our genes and impact our disease factors and, and again, do something about it? Wow. That's so powerful to me, really, to hear that, especially with your knowledge and your background. And I sent a lot of love to you with having all of this information, but then having the personal experience as well. And yeah, sending you a lot of love. Thank you. It's always personal experience too, that creates the most powerful and impactful companies and movements and information and knowledge sharing. So I just applaud you for 
having that personal frustration and then being like, well, shoot, I'm going to do something about this. You know, I'm the person to do it. So maybe just quickly share a little bit about Million Marker and what that test is that you created and how it can, you know, help people understand maybe their environmental impact. Thank you. Well, echoing to you, like Monica, I know how Mari is created is awesome. Grew from your personal experience. Um, so at Million Marker, our goal is to provide a, a mailing, a direct to consumer test, allowing people to understand their their chemical exposures. So it's a mailing urine test where you can, you know, order a kit online, um, receive the kit, basically just peeing in a cup and send it back to us. We do ask people to complete an exposure journal um, before they send us their urine sample so we can pinpoint uh, where their exposures are coming from to offer this personalized uh, recommendations to reduce exposures. Right now, we test for 13 chemical metabolites. Um, these chemicals include BPA, BPA alternatives like BPS, BPF, um, phthalates, parabens, uh, as well as oxybenzone. So all of these chemicals are uh, hormone disrupting chemicals, uh, as Monica mentioned. Many people have heard about BPA because uh, um, you probably have seen BPA free label on your either water bottle or canned food or drinks. Um, so these are hormone, again, these are hormone disruptor chemicals and they impact not only fertility, but also your weight your diabetes, the breast cancer, um, many other conditions. Can you maybe just quickly touch on, you know, I said hormone disruptor, you said hormone disruptor. What for, our, just for our listeners, what does that mean? Yeah, it's basically a group of chemicals. But when we talk about this, we better to, you know, take a step back, talk about, um, you know, what is hormone, right? Like what are the hormones? So hormones are our signaling molecules in our body. It literally like governs every bodily function we have from like sleep, your mood, your sleep, uh, uh, how your metabolism, your weight, um, everything is controlled by hormones. And, and, and if you think about it, we call it hormone disruptor, disruptor meaning like disrupting, messing up. So these chemicals basically when it comes in, when your body comes into contact with them, they mess up with your hormones. For example, BPA um, actually, um, BPA um, will impact um, estrogen and it mimics estrogen and phthalates actually blocks testosterone. So if you think about it, both men and women have testosterone and when testosterone is blocked, men would, you would see, you know, sperm count de decline. And then for women, it might not impacting women specifically, but it could impact, you know, if a woman is pregnant, with a male kid, this testosterone, lower testosterone would really impact the kid. Um, so many, many of these things, and that's why we really don't want, we really don't want these the chemicals to be in our body. And an another way to think about it is um, your hormone actually works like a lock and key. So it really has to match. So when these hormone disruptor comes in, then your lock and key wouldn't even match. So then this triggers like a bunch of downstream impact. Um, and then the one last point is why like hormone and why we really need to care about this is your hormone works in like such tiny, tiny amounts. Like think about like one drop of water in like 25 Olympic size swimming pool. That's like what it takes to cause a downstream impact. So you just like, we literally like measure these things in like nanograms. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like so tiny, you can't even see it. So you just yeah. don't want any of these in your body. And the issue is like they're literally everywhere. So we we just really need to be aware and do what we can to avoid as much as we can. That's what I was going to say, like a lot of our episodes are very much geared to menstruating people, but today is very different. This episode is really for all gendered people and it's so important, you know, working as a provider and helping people with fertility things. There's so much pressure around the female. And, you know, the person that has the uterus, the one that is going to be carrying the baby, even if you're in a same sex relationship, etc. But this conversation applies to everyone. And I really love that you brought up specifically with phthalates blocking testosterone, like that not only impacts menstruating people, but also maybe their partner and something that we need to consider if 
you've had all of these clear tests and everything looks good, but your partner hasn't really been assessed and they're still using all of these different products and working in a different environment than you might be, et cetera, or they grew up in a moldy home, all of these things. There are so many different factors that I don't think we are always checking for. And I think we'll cover a lot of <laughs> a lot of those things today too. But, you know, share this episode with any what, anyone and everyone today. Yeah, I mean, it takes two to tango. And I think like we have been focusing so much, I mean, when it comes to fertility and birth, it's the burden seems to always on women, which is like unfair. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of responsibilities already, um, but you know, men needs to look into um, their habits and then their exposure too. Because another surprising thing we have learned, initially we learned, okay, we thought these chemicals wouldn't cross um, placental barrier, but yeah, they actually do. So when these chemicals cross placental barrier, that means if a woman is pregnant, they really impact your unborn children. And the other thing is uh, what was surprising we found is not only it will pass to the next generation, it will actually pass to impact the germ cell of the, the following ge generation. That means your grandparents' exposure really impact you. So if you're you know, considering pregnancy, um, you're in a preconception stage, that means your sperm quality, your egg quality will actually impact your grandkids your exposure will impact them. So not just thinking about, you know, your unborn children, you really need to think about your grandkids because these chemicals pass down like even two generations. Yeah, in previous episode, I shared how like your grandma birthed your mother who had the eggs inside of her that created you. So that's how the lineage directly translates, right? So grandma's exposure is what's forming the egg and how you are going to impact the future generations as well, which is so cool to think about. That's crazy. <laughs> my mind right now is like, oh my God, that's crazy. Okay, so we're talking a lot about um, these chemicals and these environmental um, you know, disruptors, but where, like, where do they really show up for people? And I know you were just saying basically everywhere, but like, what are some tangible areas where you're really maybe noticing the most exposure coming from in our modern lifestyles right now? Plastic is number one. Um, so a lot of these chemicals are plasticizers. The two biggest one I just mentioned, the BPA and phthalates. These are major, major plasticizers. So they're actually like, you know, gives specific characteristic to plastic. And we're literally have like using plastics everywhere. So BPA is what makes plastic shatterproof, like it makes this really brittle, clear plastic. And phthalates is what makes plastic really flexible. Um, that's why like, you know, your water bottle have been labeled BPA free, but here I want to drop in like BPA free. doesn't mean it's other BPA free. So what has happened is since BPA has been banned, thanks to conscious mothers asking, you know, baby bottles not having BPA, uh, manufacturers started using BPA alternatives. So uh, what we have seen is the increasing in BPS, BPF. So basically they can literally swap a letter, change this molecule from BPA or all the way to BPZ or any combination of the alphabet. And what we also found out is that these alternatives are just as bad as BPA, if not worse. So we've seen like combinations like BPAF or TMBPF and then these other things like, you know, you don't even know like how the, this alphabet gets combined. Um, they're, they're way worse than, than BPA. Is there a form of plastic that is okay at all? Or is it just that some are better than others? Like where are we on plastic in general? So not all plastic are created equal. Uh, in general, I think they're all bad. We should not be using plastic. I mean, it's convenient at a time. Um, and we have this complicated relationship with plastic. It's cheap, it's useful. Um, and we can't really get rid of it all, all together. But I think people should take actions to avoid as much as possible. So uh, one way to really identify what's a better plastic is to look at the, the triangle recycling symbol on a bottle of your, any plastic, either Tupperware or bottles. 
So they're usually labeled between one to seven. So one, two, five are generally better plastic than the rest. Um, and the one, also one, two, five are the ones actually recyclable. Um, the rest of them just stay away, especially like number seven is usually other. That means like pretty much anything bad is putting number seven. So avoid that. Um, one area that from my personal experience, I found out, is, you know, if you go out and get a, a cup of coffee, right? So your coffee cup nowadays, okay, yeah, people use like a compostable, like uh, a paper compostable uh, coffee cup. Yeah, right. that's a whole different topic, <laughs> right? Compostable. I put it in air quotes because they'll say like commercially compostable, but they're not like the average. Exactly. I digress. So bring your own mug always if you can but i know COVID literally have sent us back like two decades ago like you know like we're not using any of these things anymore but uh what really worries me is the lid of your coffee cup so if you look at some of the symbols on the coffee cup like i started paying attention to things you know no coffee shop will sell me a coffee using my own mug and I, you know initially i was like drinking fun thinking about okay the cup is okay and then I took a look at the lid. Uh, so many of the lid I have seen is labeled number seven. And if you think about it, like it, you literally have this like hot liquid going through that mouthpiece and then you keep drinking it. And another thing we learned is that heat will actually increase the release of chemicals in plastic. That's why we tell people never ever microwave plastic. You know, if you, if you put your plastic in the Tupperware to store it, Ideally, you don't use that. But if you put it in the store when you're trying to warm it up, take it out into a ceramic um, bowl or something before you microwave it. And then don't use a syringe wrap when you microwave it, avoiding splashing, right? Use a plate because that syringe wrap, think about we'll just talk about like flexible plastic, totally made of phthalates. And then you put it in the microwave and then you have this heat and then you and it comes in touch with your food. And then you're basically just ingesting all these harmful chemicals so don't do that or like dish putting them in the dishwasher right like heating up that plastic ideally hand washing or again using glass to store all of your leftover food so none of those chemicals are leaching into your food finding alternatives for that uh, yeah all of this i mean the way that i kind of start this conversation with people because i think this topic can get extremely overwhelming and mm -hmm. i try to make this as digestible as possible obviously we want the same for our listeners so they're not like oh my gosh, I need to throw everything away because that's also super wasteful. That's not something that I want to encourage either. But every product that you're using, so even waking up in the morning, you hop in the shower, maybe you brush your teeth first, your toothpaste is stored in something, what is your toothbrush made out of? What is your floss yes. made out of? Then you get in the shower and looking at the ingredient labels of everything that you're putting on your scalp and your face and your body that's permeable, right? It can pass through and enter into our body. And then, yeah, from coffee cups to receipt paper, that's a huge one for me is receipt paper. Um, avoiding receipts at all costs, that BPA lined on the receipt, you touch something you just bought, and now you're going to go and eat using the same hand and, you know, or you rub your eyes, any, any of those things. But kind of just going through your day and noticing how many different products you are using. And then as you empty them, swapping it out for something better. So, you know, beauty products for me, a lot of bathing hygiene products um, i'm sure we'll dive into this more but i think kind of running through your day can be a helpful little audit to see where we can swap things out in the future and make improvements instead of doing it all at once really well said it's like perfect <laughs> that's exactly what i want to say <laughs> <laughs> okay nora you touched on beauty products and jenna i'm i'm curious are there I know like skincare and hair care and that whole genre of products is a big one too. We obviously talked about plastic being one of the huge ones, but skincare, beauty care, all of that is also has a lot of chemicals and a lot of endocrine disrupting chemicals. Are there specific chemicals we should be looking out for and or like how do we, I mean, I look at the back of a bottle and it's like, I don't know any of these words. Like what, where do you start and what, what awareness should you have around those products? 
So I think beauty product, personal care product is where people have the most control. If you think about our exposures, I mean, food, your, your kitchen, uh, Nora mentioned that you have some control, but you don't really have control over air, for example. But personal care is like you, you make a purchase. And I think all of us can become conscious consumers because by voting with your dollars, you're sending a signal to manufacturers that, hey, we need better product. So, and that's areas where I think, yeah, people can make a lot of choices and have a lot of control. And the one thing I always want to encourage also people to think about echoing what Nora just said, like think about what you actually put on your body, right? And then also in what amount, like if I just use an eyeliner versus like I put a bunch of shampoos on, you know, my hair, washing my hair, that's like a totally different amount. Like you use like, or you use like say a nice serum, a couple drops versus like this blob of a shampoo, right? And if you wash your hair every single day, that kind of exposure, the, the exposures are very different. So I always encourage people to think about where you have the most exposure, what product you use the most often in the largest amount. That's like a one single product you should look at first because that's where you get your most exposure. And in terms of the ingredients, the number one ingredient people should avoid is fragrance. Absolutely number one. So fragrance is actually made of more than like, it could be made of more than 3000 chemicals. And then fragrance is usually manufacturers would net or brands would never disclose what their fragrance is made of. So you just have no idea. And probably 90% of the time, or even 99% of the time, when you see a fragrance on your ingredient label, phthalates are always added to that fragrance. And phthalates is what makes the fragrance like last longer and stick on your body longer and also have preservative impact. So whenever you see fragrance on your ingredient label, ditch it. Even if this product says it's natural fragrance, also pay a lot of attention because what we also have seen is um, when product claiming to use a natural fragrance, they could be saying they use essential oil, but not all essential oils are actually created equal. This day and age, basically, the amount of essential oil we produce naturally is actually not enough to supply all the natural products. So the, the essential oil could be synthetic essential oil. That means it's pretty much full of phthalates. So, so be careful of essential oils. Even if it's natural essential oil, depending on how that essential oil is made, it could also be really different. If you think about how essential oil is made, it's like, okay, we need to distill like from the plants, right? We need to harvest the plant and then distill from that plant. If the distilling process of making this essential oil is being used in plastic, that plastic is heated up. Even if you use natural sources, this essential oil is still full of chemicals because the leaching of these during the manufacturing process. So the best way about going looking at fragrances go for fragrance free mm. that's the safest option and also don't be fooled by unscented mm. this word unscented many people think unscented is like fragrance free but it's not unscented is actually a scent it's actually being fragrance is being added to <laughs> unscented so so always go for fragrance free interesting yeah are there any, I mean, do you use essential oils in your life at all? Are there any brands that like are actually doing it well? I have not used any essential oils. I think we, I think we need more testing to actually physically test the product and also not just testing whatever manufacturer brands submit, give it to you. We really need to test the end consumer product. Another thing we didn't really talk about is packaging. So many brands... I think many brands started using, you know, glass packaging, say aluminum packaging, uh, more sustainable packaging, but there are still many, many brands that use plastic packaging. And again, if you think about it, if a product, even if you use good, good ingredients, um, if you put in a bad packaging, potential leaching, and then think about how your product travels from manufacturing facility to stores, and then they might, during the transportation processes, yeah, they might be sitting in a pallet, like outside baked in that sun and think about anything could be leaching into the product, right? So I think if we're able to test the end consumer product and then offering insights, so, okay, what's actually in the product, that will be a much safer way. But before we 
we do that, you know, looking at ingredient labels and then choosing a better packaging and also avoiding fragrance, that, that's really, really important. The first product swap I made was deodorant. Going from anti-perspirant, which I used probably for 10 years. We're, we're, we're meant to sweat, by the way. Like, that's a good thing. So definitely effed myself there for a very, very long time. But not only just the antiperspirant chemicals that they're using to actually block that healthy process, but aluminum, fragrance, and the location. Your skin in your armpit is much thinner than other areas of your body, and there are a ton of lymph nodes that end in your armpit. Right. Too. So for me, that's like the number one place that I like to start for people. And, but hearing that like unscented does not mean fragrance free. I think that's a really, really good reminder. So I'm curious, is there even a brand or a homemade concoction, something that you recommend for deodorant? So there are many, I think there are many brands now uh, making good in, um, deodorant. We actually curated a whole list on our website just so people don't have to do their homework. Um, so if you go to our website, we have approved product page. Um, that we curated a, a bunch of product there so you don't have to do your own homework. Um, and also back to what Monica asked, like how do you even start from, you know, looking at your ingredients besides fragrance? I think a few things, at least when I first started, you know, there are so many chemicals and we're literally making new chemicals every single day. There, there are like over 80,000 chemicals in use today. We literally only have like less than 1% with sufficient safety data. So a, a lot of them, we don't even know what they, they are doing to our bodies. So one other rule to think about is if you can choose a product with the least amount of ingredients, with a shorter ingredient list, that's generally better. Um, that's one. And the second is when I first started, again, so many chemical names, you don't know everything. Uh, other than like sorting out fragrance. Other things I look for is these cap letters. I think those are really easy to recognize. So you could see PPG or PEG, EDTA, like these cap letters. So these cap letters are usually petroleum based ingredients and then they usually specified in cap letters. And I would avoid anything with a, a ton of cap letters. So whenever a product is using petroleum based ingredient, they have like they would have a much higher chance of cross-contamination of and also impurities of uh, potential carcinogenic chemicals and other, other harmful stuff. So avoid these cap letters. Uh, besides these cap letters, um, other hormone disruptors that, that we test, like things to look for is uh, like, for example, paraben. Uh, paraben is another hormone disruptor. It has a similar impact impact as BPA and phthalates. It's usually used as a preservative in personal care products. And also not all parabens are created equal. Sometimes a product will just label parabens. Sometimes it will actually specify what type of parabens um, a product is, is using. We have four different parabens, like they're labeled like methyl, ethyl, propyl, and butyl. These are signaling like how long the paraben chain is, mm. but methyl is way less toxic than butyl. So if you see a propyl or butyl paraben, okay, ditch that immediately because those are super, super toxic. Um, and I think some products are still using it, um, but California just passed, a, a last year passed a, a California Cosmetic Act of 2023. And then in that act, propyl and butyl paraben has been banned. Uh, but they manufacture don't have to adhere to this policy until 2025. So, you know, if you actually see like propyl butyl parabens in your product, ditch that because it's, it's very toxic. And also like paraben is another place that it's a bit tricky. So what we have seen many of a uh, clean beauty product, people have phased out paraben, but not for over the counter uh, medicinal creams and ornament. That's one area that we haven't seen. Like, you know, if you use like a, some people use hydrocortisol cream for their eczema or for their rash. That's like a place that consistently we have seen parabens um, in these creams and ornament. So if you absolutely have to use it, just use it sparingly. Try not to use it every day. 
And if you have, you know, two creams side by side, one is using, you know, if they both have paraben, one's using methyl, one's using, say, propyl butyl, pick the methyl one and don't pick the, the, the propyl butyl one because they're less toxic. I feel like I'm back in organic chemistry and I'm nerding out. Yeah. And so I just wanted to clarify too, when you were talking about cap letters, you just mean like capitalized letters yeah, capital letters in the ingredients list. So like anything that's capitalized, you're like, that's a no, no. Yes. Uh, another thing also to pay attention is so ingredient, um, ingredient labels are they're listed um, in descending order by weight. So if this cap letter shows up way like in the beginning of the of your product, then that's a lot worse than say showing like like at the end of the ingredient label. Um, so that just means the amount of it. So if fragrance is showing up as the third ingredient on your ingredient label, okay, yeah, please ditch that because it's like a ton. Yeah. Gosh, I remember this from the, the last time that we talked, Jenna, but I'm just like, it is not escapable, like the amount of toxins that are in our lives. Even just thinking like, oh yeah, okay, my shampoo's in a plastic bottle. Like the yogurt I bought and eat is in a plastic container. Like, you know, like everything. Um, and I, my mind all the time is just like it's so blown by the fact that I yeah we vote with our dollars people like try to buy the right thing I guess I think we really need to stick it to some of these companies and the only way we're going to do that is to like stop buying from them yeah I think like yeah we definitely don't want people to be overwhelmed like Nora said we want people to make a one simple step like one step at a time and you know if you want to haul everything, throw everything out, it's going to cost you money, right? And and we also don't want people to, to hurt their like wallet because if that happens, then people are just not going to make any changes. Um, and the encouraging thing is a lot of these chemicals, transient chemicals, that means they actually clear out of your body within 48 hours if you stop using, if you st stop putting these things in your body. So, um, your body actually have a natural detox pathway to clear them out. Um, that means, you know, if you already have the, these products at home, you, you, if you don't want to throw them away, sure, like finish using them. But next time when you buy a product, like buy a better product. Like, um, but I will still caution people, you know, if you use that shampoo every single day in that large amount, yeah, I would throw that. Yeah. But for, you know, for like a small amount, like a face serum. Okay, sure. Like, next time you buy it, buy a better one. The other thing that I really think about is accessibility. You know, for some consumers where they can't afford certain things, I really like to call out that sometimes if you having canned tuna fish is the only way that you are able to afford getting good quality protein, things like that. I, I really like to take this into consideration too because we do have these innate abilities and, and ways that our body can filter out a lot of toxins and we can do things to support them too. And I think that would be a helpful thing for us to highlight in ways that we can support our system in doing this natural process. You don't need a green juice or a powder or anything fancy. Like our body has kidneys and liver and lungs and skin and we go to the bathroom to do all of these <laughs> things naturally. Um, but you know, from an, an accessibility standpoint, I think that this is an important thing to call out that it doesn't always have to be a more expensive item. There are a lot of like DIY things that you can do at home, making your own cleaning based solutions or making some laundry swaps that are cost effective, like using a dryer ball will help to decrease the amount of time that your clothes are in the dryer or just hanging them to dry, but that's also going to reduce if you're using anything fragrance in the laundry, etc. Um, but cleaning, you know, cleaning solutions I think are another pretty big one where you can make a swap once or make these homemade concoctions and be just as effective and it does not have to cost you hundreds and hundreds of dollars over time. Oh, absolutely. Nora, I think you're making, I mean, several <laughs> great points. Uh, one is your detox pathway, your, how your body detox these things. Um, it's much related to your lifestyle. Like in your nutrition, it's, 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 a, it's huge. Like, for example, how much antioxidant you consume, right? Like fruit, fresh fruit and veggie, colorful stuff. Like that really helps 
to help you detox. That's number one. And the second is on like a DIY stuff, like home cleaning, for example, home cleaning product, like baking soda and uh, vinegar. That's way more effective. And then that doesn't really involve, and it's cheap, right? It doesn't involve like using a bunch of like toxic chemicals. Um, and, and it's very, it, it could be very accessible. And then, and then lastly is I think accessibility price point is really, really important for people, right? We, and I think if you can't own, if you only need to swap out one thing and then just like ditch fragrance, like you don't even need to worry about the cap letter. Just, you don't have to worry about if you just like eliminate that one single thing, that's already reducing your like chemical exposure by large amount. Because what we also have seen is whenever a product is labeled with fragrance, they oftentimes is comboed with many other harmful ones. So if you just limit one thing, many things is already like automatically eliminated. That's an amazing tip. Think of two or like trash bags can be fragranced. <laughs> things that people might not think of, obviously mm -hmm. period products should, we should never put fragrance near our private parts. Never, ever, no wash, no, no period product should be scented. It is not supposed to smell like a garden down there. If you use water, our body will clean itself. <laughs> Big call out. Um, but obviously candles, air fresheners, again, those things that like, they are a part of our environment that we do have control over. So I love that one call out, just fragrance alone can have a ripple effect. Just start paying attention to the products that you're buying and making sure that it's fragrance free. I really like that. One other thing that I want to touch on before we kind of wrap up or head towards the end is, um, we haven't touched on our food and especially I think our produce. Um, and I know that there's like the dirty dozen, but where do we stand with endocrine disrupting chemicals and produce? So, um, a huge amount of endocrine disrupting chemicals in produce are coming from pesticides. Um, so, Pesticides, obviously, there's also transient pesticides and also persistent pesticides. So this makes eating organic really important. But obviously, there's also accessibility issues here. So we always want to encourage people, if you can, choose organic. And if you cannot have fresh organic, for them, frozen organic is better than conventional. And Monica, you also mentioned that EWG is 30 dozen, clean dozen. <clears throat> I think those are really good resources. And, and even if you don't look at dirty dozen or a clean dozen, I mean, if, if you think about it, pesticides is applied to the outside of a fruit and or veggie, right? If anything that you can peel, peel it. that's generally better to, if you say, if you have to choose something inorganic, if you can peel it off, then you reduce that exposure a bit. But if you think about salads, right? Like kale, uh, spinach, those are the heaviest contaminated uh, produce. And especially you're eating it raw. So for those, always choose organic or berries. Again, like there's no peel, right? Like if you're eating like inorganic, you're literally just eating a, a chemical bomb. Like, and, 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 and it, that's not going to help. And another thing to really pay attention why we want to choose organic is besides these, another really heavily used um, pesticide is glyphosate. So people might have heard about like Roundup. They have heard about, you know, there's some lawsuits going on with glyphosate. Glyphosate is a really interesting one because it's so damaging. It basically key laid out like every single good nutrients, not just like the property of the food, but all the nutrients that you think about, like that's good in your produce, it chelates it out. So, so even if you're eating fruits and veggies, you're not really getting the nutrients because this pesticide has been used. So again, always choose organic if you can. For, for the listener, like that chelate means it's like binding to it, making it like we're not able to absorb it, right? And you mentioned EWG. Would you say that that is a resource that you recommend for people like checking their even like body products? all of that, like, do you recommend that as a resource for people? I think it's a great starting resource for people. Um, having EWG's resource is better than not having, 
looking at your ingredient, really read your ingredient label is better than not reading it. But I would also have um, take it with a grain of thought because it's really hard to keep up with industry information, like having a really updated list all the time. So what we have found out is that uh, not all resources on EWG is all fully updated. Um, and also when it comes to newer chemicals that's being used, when there's a data gap, uh, you can see on the rating, it's always rated as no risk, like one versus like, so I would, uh, I would pay attention on that because uh, if we don't have data, if we have data gap, that doesn't mean it's safe. Um, so take that into consideration. And I mean, it's, it's hard uh, because even as scientists, we don't really know like what's going on, right? So in that case, I would choose a product with less ingredient listed than like have a bunch of ingredient listed that maybe you can't even find that chemical on these lists. The last question that is food related for me and something that I always bring up when we talk about endocrine disruptors, a lot of people ask me about soy and phytoestrogen. So I would love to just hear real brief like your your thoughts on that in general yeah this is a really interesting uh, question i have been thinking about this for a long time um the short answer which is not going to help anybody is uh we don't have enough research so if you think about a phytoestrogen there's still estrogen right like if you have it in your body how does that really impact you the funny thing is this is probably gonna confuse people and not gonna help is uh, when we don't have enough research, well, actually we have research on phytoestrogens, but a lot of our research on phytoestrogens have reported really good outcome from phytoestrogens. But if you think about it, if there are estrogens and, and then you have these hormone uh, uh, disrupting chemicals, they're kind of like mimicking estrogens, right? So how does your phytoestrogens really work? Like how does phytoestrogen interact with your hormone disrupting chemicals and your natural hormones? Yeah. So we actually don't have enough research on that. Like, do you personally? But I, what I want to say also is um, phytoestrogen a lot of time come with all the fiber, right? So we know fiber is good for you. Sorry, can't really answer that question. Do you personally eat soy? So <laughs> soy is also really interesting because uh, based on where your soy is produced, they could actually be having really different impacts. And again, this is also science kept uh, keeps on changing. So we don't really have a solid conclusion in terms of, okay, should you be consider, uh, you know, eating soy or should you not? But minimally, I think organic is good and non-GMO is good hmm. when it comes to soy. Interesting, super interesting. I personally incorporate soy and I, I think especially for a lot of my clients that are plant-based or uh, are vegan that you know we we need to get good quality sources of protein and this can be a really readily accessible option but yeah definitely always organic and it's individualized as is everything nutrition related if you are having crazy estrogen symptoms if you're going through menopause then or if you have genetic predisposition for things like breast cancer, that's that's when I'm very, very, very cautious about soy intake for people, especially. Yeah, I definitely have started to lean away from my mom had breast cancer. And so like, as soon as you know, I made that connection, I was just like, I don't know, soy is not even a question for me. It's just not something I'm going to play with. Yeah. Um, okay, one more thing that I want to talk about real quick, since that we are, you know, focused on menstruation so often around here is period products and the chemicals that can come along with those. I mean, for how many years were we all using Tampax and Playtex and apparently there's chemicals in those. So can we talk about that a little bit? So feminine hygiene product, that's also including not just hygiene, that's also including lubricants that people use. Yes hugely contaminated with these chemicals as Nora mentioned earlier like scented stuff like I think there's also a social issue that here that you know we have been portraying that okay we need uh, under there smell good but no like like <laughs> it's also super porous there and then if you think about it, it's like very moist and very porous and it has temperature right like 
It's a perfect breeding ground. Fragrance free if you can go for organic because how cottons are made, like how pure products are made, they're like they're not good. And also many tampons are also bleached. So when it's bleached, the additional chemicals are added. So um, when it comes to period product, okay, I think <laughs> choose organic if you can. If you use a tampon, choose an organic tampon if you can. And if you use pads, again, um, now there are like reusable pads, organic cotton reusable pads. Yes, it requires a bit of washing, but I think it's worth it. And also you're reducing a lot of plastic. Uh, period product is another thing that super contaminating to um, to the environment because they all goes into landfill and there are a ton. You know, your pads is lined with plastic, right? So if you can't use organic cotton pads, that's great. Uh, use organic cotton uh, tampon, that's great. And now we also have these uh, silicone cups. Um, so those are also reusable, that's really good. Just make sure your silicone cup is, is a, a medical grade, food grade or platinum based silicone because not all silicones are created equal. So when the silicone is not medical or food or platinum based silicone, they could have different fillers in the silicone and that could have different contaminants, including heavy metals or any of these plasticizer chemicals. Oh, that's good to know. I need to go look at mine. <laughs> Yeah, but I think there there's a trend people started switching. So yes, feminine hygiene product is very, very, very important. Yeah, agreed for sure. I mean, just to think about like, it's not even something we're putting on our skin. You know, a tampon goes inside of us. Like it's very vulnerable to absorbing. That's what it's meant there for, like to absorb. So that's just, yeah, crazy to think about. And I think the cultural uh, thing around the scent is, yeah, that needs to be, I don't even, there should not be scented products going inside our bodies. <laughs> okay, awesome. Well, this has been packed full of information. I think, I hope people listening aren't feeling overwhelmed, but are feeling empowered and feel like they're leaving with, all right, like I'm going to focus just on removing fragrance or just taking that, that very first step. I think that's so, so helpful. And hopefully, you know, this knowledge can just make a small drop change in the big bucket. But we're so, so hopeful of that. We want to do a quick lightning round that we do with all of our guests. So Jenna, are you feeling ready for this? Let's do it. Awesome. Nora, you want to go ahead? Yes, I would love to hear what is your favorite meal to cook? My favorite meal, anything with soup. Mm -hmm. I, I love making soup. Um, hydration is important. And then when I make soup, I always put a lot of veggies. Um, and it's very soothing. You know, it's like calming. And um, also, if you're thinking about, I mean, I'm a, I'm a foodie. I love to eat. And it's like hard for me to control the amount of food I eat. So whenever I have soup first, that kind of fill up my stomach a little bit. So I don't eat like too much. So yeah, I always love soup. I think you're in good company with other foodies here. We love food, so <laughs> amazing. Um, what is your period product of choice? Um, I have two. So I have been using real uh, pads, organic cotton pads. Um, so those have been pretty useful for me. I have both panty liners as well as the night ones and regular ones. I have a bunch of them. I wash them. Uh, I also have a silicone cup. I bought it from this brand called Flex. Um, um, they, the, what's really interesting is that they also make a, a disc and that disc um, um, makes it safe or easy to have period sex, which is kind of good. Um, and now they recently have a reusable disc. Now they used to be disposable one. Now they have a reusable one as well as silicone cup. Their silicone cup also have this little pool tag which makes inserting and pulling out a lot easier so these are the two like uh so far are my favorite and if i'm traveling which makes it washing the pads harder um i do use a tampon and i think the brand i use is natural care they um they do make an organic con uh tampon so these are the three things uh, are my favorites i think they have cardboard um applicators as well yes Yes. 
So yeah, it's less plastic into the environment as well, which is really nice. And what is your favorite way to de-stress? My favorite way to de-stress um, is uh, soaking in a hot tub. Oh, I, I, I love spas. I love soaking. If I don't do the whole body, I always soak my feet. Mm. Um, it helps uh, with sleep. It's also like, a, I think it's an ancient Chinese tradition too, that if you soak your feet, um, if your feet are warm, then you always sleep better. Um, and you can uh, put some herbs in your in your soaking water too. Like ginger is one to, um, I think in traditional Chinese medicine kind of releases like wetness. So you can put a, pe- a couple pieces of ginger in your soaking water or your soaking tub, like Epsom salt, people have been using that. So I think um, have a soak that always like relax me. That made me think, I was gonna say about simmer pots to make your home smell good as a swap to candles. Just thinking about the ginger in the foot bath, yeah. you think of that. But I love that as an alternative to uh, a candle or even essential oils is cutting up some herbs, some citrus, some cinnamon or cardamom cloves and just putting it on a pot on your stove and letting it simmer and it makes your home fragrant and smells clean without having any of those chemicals and things. Totally a tangent. I always do that around the holidays, but with like orange and cloves and then like sprigs from the Christmas tree. Like, and it's so, I mean, Christmas is over, but that is just like so good in the winter. Um, I was going to say too, like I do foot soaking sometimes for migraines. Mm-hmm. If I get a migraine, if I put my feet in warm water with Epsom salt, I feel like somehow it like draws my migraine out, which yeah, it is so relaxing. You can have Christmas every day and, and yeah. <laughs> have those herbs. <laughs> I, I love it. That's a really good tip. Uh, oh, actually, like one thing I want to mention about candle is um, besides fragrance, burning candle actually increase your indoor air pollution. Uh, burning candle actually creates these, ke- not chemicals, but these part- par- particulates that we call it particulate matters, the PM 2.5, that's what in air pollution. So burning candle actually creates that and that that's linked with lung cancer. So, I mean, I understand burning candle is you know it's very romantic it's very relaxing but yes use nora and monica's method simmer pots like ditch the candles Uh, i'm definitely guilty of candles i have one on my desk and i do really like it so uh, maybe i'll have to get like a hot plate on my desk and do a simmer pot in my office (laughs) i mean once in a while i think it's okay Obviously, none of these things will kill you, um, but if you can make a little change, that's that's always good. But I also wouldn't like be too stressed out because you know when we're stressed, we exactly. release cortisol, right? And then that's also another hormone, and you kind of don't want like extra cortisol in your body, which then might actually disrupt your your detox process. So I wouldn't be too stressed out about it. Okay, last question. Are you more of a morning routine person or a nighttime routine person? Morning, I would say. Is there anything like for you that is a non-negotiable in your morning routine? Um, a little bit of drop of caffeine to wake me up. Um, so that's my, I, I make myself a, a, a matcha latte in the morning with the oat milk or soy milk or almond milk. Um, that's always really my thing. Yeah. We learned a lot about the difference between, you know, coffee and matcha. We did a whole episode on this. So if anyone listening hasn't listened to that, go back and listen. It's in season one. So good. Um, and matcha has so many amazing benefits, um, compared to coffee. Uh, absolutely. And I, I decided not to buy my matcha latte outside, uh, because it's so easy to make at home and so cheap. Um, I guess maybe you guys covered it. Like, I think one trick with making matcha latte is dissolve your matcha in room temperature water or cold water before you add on your drinks. So it wouldn't clog and it wouldn't, you know, it would just be really smooth. That's like one single trick I learned of making, you know, actually great matcha latte. So you never have to buy again (laughs) because it's so simple. Yeah, I love that. I actually didn't know that. So that's a great tip. Thank you. Uh, this is amazing. 
Jenna, thank you so, so much for being on today. This has been packed with information and we are so excited to share it with our audience. No, thank you so much for having me. And it was so awesome to, to chatting with you guys again. Where can our listeners find you? Oh, so uh, we're pretty active on social media and also our website. We constantly, I mean, education is the key, right? We want everybody to understand this information, be aware of these chemicals, regardless if you buy our test or not. So we have a ton of education materials on our website. These are easily digestible stuff. So you can find us on www.millionmarker.com. Um, we're also pretty active on social media. We're doing Instagram live all the time, inviting different experts to come and talk about anything from chemicals to anything healthy lifestyle. Uh, so check it, check us out, just million underscore marker. Um, and we're also on Twitter, but we're probably most active on Instagram. Amazing. We are going to link all of this in the show notes so that everyone can go and check out what Jenna is building, how you can potentially test your own endocrine disruptors and chemicals and learn more. So thank you, Jenna. We are so, so grateful for your time and we can't wait to see all that you continue to do to bring awareness to this topic. Thank you so much for having me.